Greetings and welcome to the You Talk Show, where we talk and you listen and we all learn something, hopefully, in a wonderful discussion. Today, we are talking about the one and the only racist question of all time, why does the government hire expensive consultants? I know, very exciting. We're wondering why the government hires consultants at a great expense. Okay, so... (laughs) There is there is a different question underpinning this question. Heck, you have been bamboozled, Kyle. Why does consulting exist as a thing that people do? Well, you see, no, no, no. See, there's see, I haven't been when bamboozled. Look I at was about to actually hiring consultants. Yeah, when we look at governments hiring consultants, we have to ask: Don't they have guys for this? So okay, well, what are you getting into? Because I'm I'm going to go. I've got the his the sort of the history of consulting okay. as an industry ready to go. Well, I was going to get into you know what what need does it is it meant to fill? You know, in the what's the idea behind the need that it is filling? And that is the need for expertise. Sometimes the government won't have on hand expertise for something that they are needing to make policy for, and so they will hire consultants to give them or gain them that expertise, that knowledge that they need in order to make policy decisions and write legislation. That is the idea behind it. However, what it's turned out to be is one massive grifting operation where huge corporations of consultants... Hey, 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 it's not grifting. It's not grifting. It's creative accounting, okay? (laughs) Okay, let me me prove you wrong right here. Have you heard about... Reframing! Have you heard about PwC Consulting recently? Yes, I have, and that's actually part of the thing that I was going to bring up. Yeah, because because they quite they quite literally, on the one hand, were telling the government how to write tax law in order to stop tax avoidance, <laughs> and on the other hand, they were consulting with corporations, telling them how to skirt the new laws that they themselves were advising the government to implement. That is a grift if okay, I ever that's saw just one. Double dipping. And fuck those that's guys. That's double dipping. That's not just double okay, dipping. So that is that is a dipping, grift and a half. Technically, it's triple dipping if you enc- if you um, account for the fact that they're also thus disenfranchising the voting public. But you know, um, so here's the deal: consulting as an industry is really, really very new. Mm. Um, it is younger than modern German. Mm. And, like, you think of Germany and you think of a tradition going back many hundreds of years, and you're not far wrong, but Germany as a modern country only really started existing in the 1920s. Germany is a baby. Australia is older than modern Germany. Even though oh, it doesn't yeah, you're kind of right. Well, I mean, actually, so hold on. You're saying 1920s. You're saying 1920s. When, mm-hmm. did, when did they first have a parliament, though? Was that the 20s? That was the Weimar Republic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, you're right. That is that was the twenties. Wow. In in any case, uh, so in 1926, an American, of course, an American, came up with this idea. Um, James McKinsey, a certified public accountant working for the state of Illinois, saw the U.S. Army being kind of bad at life, and he went, you know what? It's not their fault that they don't know how accounting works. I have a different perspective on this, so I'm going to try and teach them to not be wasteful. And he did. And then he started his own firm, the accounting and management firm, where he taught people how to resolve their business needs through the lens of accounting. In 44, three officers existed in the US. Um, In 1959, he opened an office in London. Uh, That company, I don't think it still exists. No, it had BMBB. That still exists. Shortly after this, we see um, the accounting-oriented firms. uh, So Dillowy, KPMG, which you will have heard about. Dillowy, you mean Deloitte? KPMG. You mean Deloitte? Deloitte. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming because it's a French name that I should pronounce it in something vaguely approximating French. Uh, But KPMG, who have been in the news for consulting the Australian government, PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, I don't know if 
Price Waterhouse or Coopers are actually involved anymore, <laughs> but the name was too good to pass up. And a fourth firm, Ernst and Young, basically shaped the industry. But it also means that they created for themselves out of cloth an industry that previously didn't exist. As for the government side of things, as Carl said, sometimes you don't have expert staff on hand, and sometimes you need to be able to access expertise that is not something you have in-house. And so you hire a consulting firm, and they pay some independent experts a fraction of what you paid them, and those independent experts pay their staff a fraction of what they're getting paid, and it's, yeah, everyone's taking a little bit of a shave. It's fine. Hmm. Actually, on that, on but taking the question a little is, bit of a shape, if I, if I could just... Why don't quickly, we just employ those of... experts for the same rate they're being charged and just keep them around in case? Yeah, well... It, on 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 that taking off a little bit of a shape, I remember yeah. a... I remember a thing from... Uh, it was on, you know, Real Time with Bill Maher? And, you know, Bill Maher is, is a comedian. A comedian and political commentator in the U.S., Bill Maher. Spelt like oh, yeah, Bill Maher, yeah. Yeah, yeah. M-A-H-E-R. Yeah, yeah. So he actually once um, talked about this and how in, I think it was California, basically there was a massive homelessness problem and how they'd once dealt with it before. Yes. How back in, I think it was either, the, I think it was the 60s, 50s or 60s, they, for a fraction even adjusted for inflation, a small fraction of what they recently paid, they solved the problem back then. They just built public housing. And how for a much larger, you know, again, that was a fraction of what they've just paid to try and solve the problem. And they didn't solve the problem this time around. And that it was found that most of the money went to consultants. Like we're talking like 80 or 90% of it went to consultants rather than actually solving the problem. Yeah. And so, you know, so that's, so, you know, the question, the original question is what just was not just why does the government hire consultants, but why does the the government hire expensive consultants? Well, because cheap consultants are worth what you pay for them, of course. Well, yes, but I, the, these prices are clearly inflated. And I've seen professional I've seen indemnity is a problem, though, right? Say it again. Let's say that a professional indemnity is a problem. Um, let's say to find indemnity again. I'm forgetting what that word is. Give me a minute. Let's say that I'm an engineer, and I'm designing a bridge. Um, and let's say that I forget to carry a digit somewhere in the calculations. And before the bridge is set to open, like one of the structures blows over in the wind. Mm. That fuck up's on me. Now, if I'm working as a consulting engineer, I pay for insurance um, up to a certain value yearly. And that goes some way towards not completely ruining me if I had a bad night and forgot to carry a digit. If I'm working for a firm, that firm has insurance. That insurance is not cheap. If you are part of the value proposition, if you pay a large amount of money to a consulting firm or to a consultant, is that you have someone to sue if it goes wrong. And usually that's their insurance company. I can... in Let's say that I am a baby engineer. I have just graduated with my like engineering degree. And I walk in and say, I will fix this problem for you for $200 an hour. And I forget to carry a digit somewhere. Structure blows over. Uh, I don't have insurance, so they sue me directly. They don't get any money out of me. I'm ruined. I kill myself. There's still a bridge blown over somewhere. The idea of professional indemnity is that even professionals make mistakes and that there is a certain set of legal protections 
in place for if they do make mistakes so that nobody is too badly put out. You'll hear in legal and medical circles the concept of malpractice insurance. It's the same basic principle. If I hire a lawyer and they give me very bad advice and on the basis of that advice I lose a lot of money, then I have a legal claim against that lawyer for cocking it up. I would pursue them in court or potentially through an industry body and they would be in part responsible for making it right. If I have a fly-by-night lawyer with no office and a suitcase and a cheap suit and a perpetually under, like, sleep-deprived look in his eyes, he's probably going to have fled to the next town by the time I can actually realise that he has caused me harm. Does that explain a little bit about why the consultants are so expensive? Well, I mean, it, I because think I'd it goes away to explain. In, in light of that, the problem is that we don't pursue the consultants when they give bad advice, and that's where it starts to look like a grift. I mean, I'd say, well, I'd say it is still <clears throat> to some degree a grift. You know, we don't need to spend 90% mm, mm. of the money on consultancy. We don't need to spend, you know, like, I think, I honestly think that we should limit the amount that can be spent on consultants to something like less than a, a fifth, something like around 15% of... Um, no, no, wrong problem. Um, government needs to be able to pay consultants market rates um, in the same reason as part of my proposed ideas for fixing the healthcare system are making sure that working for a state or federal healthcare body is competitive with working in the private sector. If, if we artificially limit... Um, the amount of money we spend on consultants, then consultants do not send us their best people. The solution instead is to have in-house expertise in government mm. at every level and agreements with uh, private contractors for very specialised circumstances. Mm. Perhaps have, uh, have experts from every single field on retainer. Um, yes. Hmm. I mean, that, that would probably lessen the price a lot and, you know, at the same time we'd get the expertise, all the expertise we needed, and there'd be a lot... But someone who has a direct contract with government would also have um, a certain responsibility to say, why the fuck are you asking me this? I've already told you two months ago, as per my last email, stop wasting my time and fix the damn problem. Hmm. So, I mean, to be honest, this wasn't quite the answer I was expecting. I was expecting at least like halfway to go on a rant about, you know, how basically it's all entirely grift. But I think it partly changed my mind. Partly, though. Well, here's the thing. I, I, I agree with you that there is a lot of grift happening. And mm. I, I think that the, the difference between our worldviews is not so great. It's simply that I'm looking at it as um, the fact that government has itself stripped down to the point where it needs so often to consult external firms isn't yeah, a, see that's well, you know I mean, what i just realized a, it may be a symptom of corruption you know what i just right? but it's you know not what I just, actually the whole story you know what i just realized it's not it's not so much consultancy or consultants that are like like it's 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 basically the a function of government has been privatized the function of yes, being able exactly. to learn things, being able to get good information, that function of government has been privatized. And yes, and as with many aspects of privatization, that has proven to be immensely profitable for the corporations who get a cut and, and immensely, immensely impoverishing for, for the people. Yeah. Yeah. This was an interesting conversation. This was, you know, I, I feel like I've learned something and my mind's kind of been changed, but at the same time, it went very differently to what I expected. But there is a problem here, and it is a problem to be fixed, and we can fix it. Yes, and I think we. I think. I think that is actually the solution. takeaway. We can fix this without stepping on any toes. Yeah, or rather, we. I mean, we'd still need to step on some toes because essentially we're hiring less external consultants, and instead we're you know directly going to experts and hire and having them hired on retainer for when we need them, 
Yeah, but um, at the same time, there is no reason that you couldn't have favorable deals negotiated for specialist expertise with these firms whose entire job is to provide expertise. This doesn't need to be a losing to, proposition totally. To, well, I mean, look, I think I think you're being a bit optimistic there, but I do see what you're saying. It can, yeah, you know, it can be, it can be, you know, less negative for the big consulting firms than I think. Like that. Look, you know, pure management saying. consulting is a very, very new industry, and it's an industry which these consulting firms have basically just created from thin air. So I would think that these consulting firms would see that in light of changing circumstances, they would be able to adapt their niche to continue operating in a way that is profitable. Mm. If they can't, they're not very good at their jobs. And hence, they should be thrown out anyway. So, bingo. All right. All right. Well, uh, all right. Interesting discussion. I think we'll leave it there. Good as always, Horst. I think and, so. Uh, hope everyone else enjoyed the discussion. Everyone, you all have a lovely night. Yeah, have a good one.